Hello there, viewers, and welcome back to another episode of the Hit or Miss Star Trek podcast. Uh, this is the continuation of Series 2, which is dealing with the Borg and Advanced AI. Uh, and again, this week, we're taking a break from the Borg uh, to deal with probably Star Trek's most famous other Advanced AI data. Uh, we're going to be looking at The Measure of a Man, the Next Generation episode later, something of a famous episode. Um, but without any further ado, as always, I am joined by a special guest, uh, and I'm going to let her introduce herself to the world now. <laughs> Oh gosh. <laughs> um, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Janie. Uh, if you see me on Twitter, I'm Captain Janie. <laughs> and uh, yeah, um, let's see. I'm a gigantic Star Trek fan and I host the bi-weekly Trans Lumber Party uh, that's organized on Twitter, but run on Zoom. Uh, would you like a social <laughs> life and not get sick with COVID? I, I have just the thing. <laughs> I think that's, that's basically what we've all been struggling to do, hasn't it, the last couple of years? Crazy, <laughs> do you want a social uh, life? Do you want to not catch a terrible disease? <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Coincidentally, yeah, a couple of months into the pandemic, bright idea. <laughs> that's awesome. But at least you're connecting with people from around the world, I assume, because... Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Uh, you know, on both sides of the pond, uh, and anybody who's up during... The times in which I am, I guess. I don't know. It just, it just kind of worked out. That's awesome. And uh, where exactly are you calling from, by the way? Today? It occurs to me, I forgot to ask. I'm assuming somewhere in America, judging by the accent. Yes, yes. Uh, well, this particular filthy American is currently residing in Houston, Texas, where it is okay. not so great to be a trans person. Uh, but then again, there's a yeah. lot of where it isn't so great to be a trans person, but like specifically Texas lately, so. Yeah, oh, it's yeah. horrendous. If, uh, yeah, do be, be politically aware. It's not something I tend to get into a lot in the in this particular sure. show, but do try to be politically aware and be nice to each other. It's about yeah. the, the base level I can pretty much put out into right. the world. But, uh... You know, if we, <laughs> I, I hear there's this whole IDIC thing that's really. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I've, I've heard of, I've heard about respecting other human beings or something, but it seems like a foreign concept to sadly I, at I, least I, half of both of our countries. I think. <laughs> oh yeah, God! There's apparently they're just not getting that memo. Leaving shit on <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, exactly. Yeah. Oh well, we'll keep trying to drum it in. Bless them, and uh, if they watch Star Trek, maybe some of it will just rub off on them by proxy. So, <laughs> maybe. Only hope. God. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, anyway, we're here to just forget about all that and uh, talk about something we love for uh, a little bit. And that's that, of course, is Star Trek. So uh, without any further ado, I'm going to jump into my first section. Uh, if you're not familiar with the podcast, it works in sort of little sections. Uh, the first one's just kind of a getting to know you. Um, and it's the section that I geekily call Healing Frequencies Open. Healing Frequencies Open, sir. Uh, awesome. So um, because you're a new guest, uh, I'm rubbing my hands with glee because I get to ask you all the questions that I asked all my first time guests in the first series. Um, okay. And so the very first question, because uh, you should know, by the way, listeners and viewers, that nobody knows about these in advance, unless they've watched the podcast, I suppose. Um, so it's very much off the cuff kind of first response. Uh, and the very first question would be this. If you had to pick any three episodes or movies uh, from anywhere in the Star Trek franchise to introduce a newcomer to Star Trek or that you think represent the very best of the franchise, which three things are you picking? <laughs> Jesus. All right. So they're coming in with nothing and I got three episodes to do it. Well, um, yeah, I mean, if, if, if three things that you either think would be the best, like, oh, if they don't like that, then there's no hope, or just three things that you think would be a good intro, I guess, because um, sometimes they are different things, obviously. Right. God, that would be... Ah, that is hard to do. Like, because I, I, I would... Because I would want to do, like, the potential for more. Like, I... Mm. Like, there's no pilot that's good enough for this. Like, we're going to have to jump... <laughs> And like, did you, like, I'm gonna sit down some noob to where no man's gone before. Fuck that. No. Uh, I think you could show them the cage. <laughs> did you yeah, do we worse than that? We absolutely. Uh, <laughs> but just, ah, uh, I don't know. Uh, I th honestly, we could show them for a measure of a man would be one of them. Mm. 
that I actually did come up quite a lot when I was asking in the first series. A lot of people said that because it's kind of, <laughs> without wanting to spoil the review too much, it's a lot of people would say it's the first kind of bona fide classic of certainly the sort of modern next gen type era. So yeah, exactly. That makes sense. It's the first like stellar kind of standout kind of a thing. Um, hmm. So yeah, definitely there. Um, God. Because there's so many things I could pull from. Um, mm, I don't know. Can we have time dilation and just show them all the Dominion War for fun? For fun. Um, <laughs> well, you can um, you can pick key moments if you want. Because I think um, if you showed somebody like favor the bold sacrifice of angels, I'd count that as one thing since it's kind of a two parter. And I think they've got everything they need right there. <laughs> sure. And I, I think we do need to do one TOS episode. Just, mm. I, I don't know. I, I feel like the way I came into all of it, like when I was a kid, it was episodes of Next Gen with my dad that were still like airing on broadcast television. Uh, mm. and, and that led to, you know, going from there. And it wasn't until like I had seen like all of Next Gen and most of DS9 and Voyager before I'd like really seen like an original series episode. And, and I kind of avoided it. And then I got to a point where I'd seen like everything but that. And so now it's sort of fun to go back to TOS episodes just with this aghast. These, these, <laughs> these, these people are supposed to be Starfleet officers. And I just, yeah. I, mm, what? <laughs> Some of it's very 1960s, unfortunately, still. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah. Well, um, it's the pirate, pilot episode. Hey, Captain Pike, have you considered owning green women? You know, mm. I just can't get used to a woman on the bridge, number one. <laughs> right. Just can't do it. The estrogen it clogs my nostrils. Um, uh, I don't know. We could, I would say, like, maybe, like, just for the, you know, just to kind of get them the snapshot of, like, I almost want to say trouble with troubles. Like, That's just it. to That's kind of that yeah, like give him a good. You need one episode of. Well, this is where your origin point is, and you can get mm. the triple thing, you get all the stuff around and everything, and then there you are, and then you can move on to, you know, a, a little bit more. I think yeah, the triple Trek is a good one to show them that kind of because a lot of people are like Star Trek. That's really boring and self serious and stuff. And if you show them trouble with triples, you're like, ha, watch this if you think that's all Star Trek can do. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a good call, I think, in that regard. See, I went the opposite way. I, I said I would have showed people um, the city on the edge of forever. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. I will make you cry if you're gonna watch Star Trek. Like, that is, yeah. If you do just want to punch someone directly in their emotion, City on the Edge of Forever is definitely the clutch choice there. Uh, yeah. I always tend to go on the side of levity and comedy because I am that bitch about it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, that's, so I'll go trouble with troubles. But uh, but yeah, honestly, like you could do, you could do City on Edge of Forever, and and Measure of a Man. And I'm waiting on you saying Bride of Chaotica since you mentioned only the ones with levity and humor. <laughs> Inner Light. Oh, okay, yeah. Oh, wow, Inner that one light. comes up a lot as well, yeah, Inner Light. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I know I'm not exactly being original with it, but it's fucking Inner it's... Light. I need to watch that again. I watched it once years ago and I was just kind of like, it's a little bit slow and boring for me, but maybe I've changed my mind since then. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. Like, like the slower, boring ones are now kind of like the, the the ones I enjoy a little bit more. Uh, and and I love all the new series, but also like we, we, we could slow down the camera just to squidge and like <laughs> spend $5 on an episode just talking in a fucking room. You can totally do it. Tell the effects guys to go home. <laughs> You know. Especially if you give given the caliber of actors, I mean, I, I'd pay them for a full episode just to hear Tig Notaro for forty five minutes. <laughs> oh God, yeah, I would listen to Tig Notaro forever. Yeah, for sure. Every line um, is a gem. She's fantastic. <laughs> oh my God, yes. Oh, good lord. Yeah, the oh, the new series do feel like with Discovery, especially like the emotional pathos and the way they the way the. They feel so much more like a family mm. than like almost even Voyager did at times. So the second big question then of the uh, intro is just, um, do you recall what it was that introduced you to what first episode got you hooked and what got you to sort of think, I want to carry on watching? 
Oh, like I don't have a distinct memory of the first episode or anything. Uh, like I said before, I, like my initial intro to it was uh, was watching, you know, like Next Gen uh, with my dad, like as it aired. I was I was born in 83. So uh, so like I must have been. Yeah, like not too, not not that that old at the time. Uh, I will let everyone else do the math. Um, and and so that was like I think my first introduction, but I think I I really actually got into it. Uh, there was there was a summer where I distinctly remember I feel like I spent fifty percent of my time in the car with my parents as they were desperately trying to find wherever we were try- going to move to, and that took the summer uh and so i had been gifted uh the second edition of the star trek encyclopedia and i had that too <laughs> yeah yeah so good yeah it's still like, oh, good they got the first contact things in it yay <laughs> um yeah <laughs> and uh and so yeah i i went back and forth cover to cover on that thing I, I had nicknames for the phaser types. It's like, oh, this is the, you know, it's like, this is the Dustbuster one, and this is the, the military one. This is really, you know, I, just, I, I, I came into it very much from, you know, initially just kind of a geeking out, looking at, you know, kind of like the, the hardware and things like that. And as a as a trans person, uh, there 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 is also like maybe some. Ooh, uh, there was also you know as as puberty set in some some feelings, mm-hmm. and and so I know a lot of it was me, kind of looking towards oh if only I had an afternoon in sick bay, oh the <laughs> things I can fix. With an afternoon in sick bag, you know, it, it, if they can turn Deanna Troy into a Romulan, they can make me look however the fuck I want. I'd, I'm sure if, if I book a day, that's probably plenty. I'll go in with Crusher. She'll be very nice. You know, I'm sure. It'll be that's fair enough. I understand that. Yeah. I mean, uh, when right. you look at some of the things they've pulled off by here, uh, what, what they call surgically altering the people or whatever, then... Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. It's it. They, they can do all do it all very well, very quickly, and then easily dismissed. He's just like, "Come on back. I'm sure you had a great time. Tell me the story as I get the goop off your forehead. It's fine." <laughs> exactly. Uh, the final kind of question then in this intro, um, not to put you on the spot or anything, but going to your head, if you had to pick one series uh, that you'd say is your favorite Trek series out of the whatever we're on to now, uh, what would be the your number one? But 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 they. They are all my children, and I love them equally. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, for me, it's it. I. Hmm. It is a dead heat between Next Gen and Voyager, and I think Voyager wins by an inch, just because. It, you know, I was watching that during a time in my life where I needed it a little. And, yeah. and, 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 and just, you know, the nostalgia factor alone will help me smooth over the rough edges uh, mm. by comparison to next year. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's fair enough. And, uh, oh, awesome. Right. Who knows? Glad- who knew how much I needed a girl captain at the time? <laughs> who would have so didn't even that didn't even occur to me actually i just think that there was very much i was i was kind of going through a lot at that kind of time because obviously being a similar age it would probably have been you know teen years and angsty and it was very much uh let's just watch my family in the delta quadrant for uh for 45 minutes or two an hour yeah, and a half and just chill. <laughs> um Why, yeah. watch well, very be special friends <laughs> exactly <laughs> but no that you're a girl after my own heart next gen and voyager are my favorite too uh, although I go the other way, I probably would put next gen above. But I'm sick of hearing people say Deep Space Nine, so I'm quite relieved. <laughs> I know. I, we love Deep Space Nine. It's wonderful. Jed Z adapts is my heart. But I, <laughs> yeah, it's it. It went from 
nobody likes DS9 to everybody likes DS9 to DS9 supremacy is like calm down. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's I think we've we've gotten to know you a little bit better, at least in terms of your track tastes, I think. Um so with that in mind, I'm gonna move on to the next section, uh, which is the section that gives the podcast its name. Uh, so it is the hit or miss section. What about my performance? <laughs> I'm not a drama because I just can't. Um, if you are a first time listener or you're not familiar, what this is is basically um, it, it was kind of just an idea to give an extra flavor to my podcast. So I'm going to shout out like five or six things from anywhere in the Trek universe that I've just written down. I just started before the series and wrote like a list of 100 random things. So it's just random yeah. things from anywhere in the Trek universe. And I'm going to spit them out. You have no idea what's coming because you haven't been told in advance. And you need to tell me if you think those things are a hit or a miss. Uh, and your reasons as to why, and then if we disagree, maybe debate back and forth, though that tends not to happen a lot. <laughs> so, yeah. are you ready then? Let's do it. Awesome. Uh, the first thing on my list for today then, um, because I'm trying to pepper in some things about advanced AI given the series, uh, is the Moriarty hologram from Next Gen, hit or miss? Ooh, I'm going to have to say that's a hit. That's, oh. hey, we, we, we love Moriarty. Uh, you know, you, you, you can sit and winnow down the whole idea of the, the holodeck somehow making something that good. And what does that say about it? It's a fun time. It's a fun time. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't think too hard about it. It's a good time. Yeah, don't think about the philosophy of it. That was, <laughs> we're not here for that. <laughs> you know, we can do that. I'm not your mom. Do what you want. But at the same time, sometimes you want to have some fun. Yeah, maybe just don't play God once once in a while, just once maybe. a week. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. Right. You know, if we can dial back on the deity play, then I think <laughs> we can get somewhere. Oh, every every sentence out of your mouth is a gem. I love it. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I, I think the same Moriarty hologram is such a, an intriguing idea uh, that they created it as, as something to foil data in the computer, sort of... the. the leaps in logic that the computer had to work out to be like oh th that's how we're gonna get there whoever right. wrote it was just either on something or was just i don't know up late in the morning thinking i need to just come up with any old reason why but yeah i love the the ridiculousness of it and i love the um the fact that it the, the character came back like four or five years later yeah. just a random one-off character from nowhere right. And uh, and this time he brought Stephanie Beecham. <laughs> yeah, you know, hey, why not? She she wasn't doing anything. Bring her along. Why not? <laughs> exactly. But no, those are two great episodes, especially if you're dealing with the idea of like what is consciousness and at what point is it a computer? Is it real, etc. Which are the big right. questions Trek asks a lot. Um, yeah. Somebody pointed this out on Twitter the other day, and it got me really thinking. With mm -hmm. the advances in technology in Picard and the fact that it's now not illegal. Could you technically transfer the Moriarty Hollow program into one of those golem type droid bodies like uh, Picard has? And if so, uh, why haven't they yet? <laughs> uh, um, you totally can, and bureaucracy. That's got to be it. <laughs> uh, that fucker's in mothballs. And that's because, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, they're not pushing that through. Bigger fish to fry out there in the old 20th uh, century now. The, the uh, bureaucracy survives well, I guess. Then. Yeah, yeah, that's it's what it is. You, you know, we, we, we can have all the beautiful, fully automated luxury space communism we want, but apparently we haven't thrown away all the red tape just yet. Exactly. <laughs> oh, that's fair enough. It's probably just in a in a big crate somewhere, just on top of the Ark of the Covenant, being stowed away, examined by top men. You know? Right. <laughs> that's fair enough. There's a, there's a potentially great story there, that, and I, I would I just want to see them bring as many sort of holograms into bodies as they can. So bring Moriarty, Vic Fontaine, and the holographic Doctor. Give them all bodies, and then just sit them in a room and make them argue. <laughs> no goodness. Well, you know, I think, well, this is, this has to be something they choose for themselves. You know, we're not just, you know, where it's, it's no longer an exercise if we're just forcing them into the idea. No, of course. <laughs> well, that's not going to full space fascism either. You know? <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. 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 No. They, they do, they do have to choose it first. I get the feeling Moriarty would choose it. I'm not sure about the other two, but we'll, <laughs> we'd have to decide to, uh, you know, gauge their opinion a bit. So. Yeah. Way. Um, so yeah, the second thing on my list, again, kind of related to the theme, is uh, the character of Dr. Richard Daystrom uh, from the original series. Hit or miss? Oh, yeah, God. Uh, I kind of barely remember that episode, 
honestly, like e e TOS is going to be my weakest point. But if you want to hit me, there you go. Anything else, we're good. Uh, <laughs> so, um, I mean, you might as well have the guy, if you're going to reference the Daystrom Institute all the time, you might as well take a look at that guy for four seconds. Ah! Yeah. You do if he was more memorable, I would have been remembering him right now. Miss. <laughs> miss. Genuine. Why? That's fair enough. There you go. It's a miss because otherwise it would have stuck in my brain better. I've decided That's... these are my rules. I make them up. There we go. Impeccable logic. I, I, I'm going to go ahead and disagree. I think he's a hit because, and again, this really shouldn't be a, a revolutionary baseline thing to achieve, but it's a black man in 1960s. And he's portrayed as intelligent and capable. Okay, slightly evil, maybe not the best, but, <laughs> yeah. but you know, baby steps. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, I love that. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of moral ambiguity in that character because, like you said, they named the institute after him that gets name checked constantly, and yet he fucked up badly. <laughs> you know? But they were like, yeah. one mistake shouldn't ruin a man's legacy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Which is some classic human horse shit. Totally on brand for us. I love that. Yeah. So then, the, the number three on my list for today is uh, the Steam Runner class. Purely because it turned up in Picard this week. <laughs> yes, yeah, this is oh, a hit. I love the Steam Runner class. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe I played too much Star Trek Armada and that's why. But Oh, wow, Right. I love that runty little sled looking motherfucker. Uh, adorable. I do believe that's what's Let's, written on the dedication plaque, actually. Runty right. little fucking motherfucker. Let me make 12 of you and ruin somebody's star base. Yes. <laughs> oh, I've never played you know, that game. Oh, I want to. Just like that. <laughs> right. You always make a contingent of them and then you protect them with a gaggle of, you know, whatever you got dilithium for at the time. If you can have a, a gaggle of galaxy classes and a couple of sovereigns, great. Otherwise, you need just a Kira country and a few Defiance to pepper in. And then there you are. There you nice. Are. Awesome. It's a good looking ship. It, it, it surprises me because it, it it works really well from some angles, not so much from others. So in First yeah. Contact, it was, uh, it was one of the ones in First Contact that I just didn't really notice or pay any attention to because the, the flashy ones are like the Akira and the um, the like Norway class and stuff that look more starshipy, I guess. Right. Um, Maybe that's why I like the Steam Runner class. I have my particular angles, and we're going to stay well with them. <laughs> that's very true of the class of ship. Yes. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, since since getting the model and since seeing it, especially in Usain Picard when they showed it off really well, I think it's a really cool looking sort of mid level type ship. It's not super advanced or anything, but it looks tough, and uh, yeah, can obviously hold its own against the Borg. Not so well against a random whatever freighter the last Serena is but you know yeah less so against <laughs> that bag of bolts jesus all right <laughs> but in fairness seven of nine was piloting it so we'll give them that credit yeah there you go there you go Plus almost doesn't or... even need the ship <laughs> right annika hansen points yes exactly <laughs> she's like the, the trump card if you had a video game where it's like you know just level up stick seven of nine in your pilot seat and destroy everything anyway <laughs> board powers activates <laughs> nice uh, i'll do a couple more then the next one will be more your speed uh, it's another episode but this time of voyager uh, and it's the episode pathfinder hit or miss oh shit. which one was pathfinder it's the first one with um, Barkley and Troy in, basically, where they... Yeah, there we go. Sorry, uh, brain fart. Uh, yeah, oh, that's a fucking hit. That's absolutely a hit. Uh, you, you, you know, if we can expand him beyond the broccoli and have an opportunity to watch Deanna be the hot chocolate slut we know and love, then, uh, yeah, that's a good episode of Star Trek for me. <laughs> Wonderful. Oh, uh, you're the second person that calls Deanna Troy a chocolate slut purely because of that video on YouTube. <laughs> I'm yes, exactly. Yeah, I, oh, uh, uh, absolutely. Why, why don't we fax apple juice to each other? I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I have to introduce you to my friends Andy and Phil at some point. You'd get along. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, yeah, Pathfinder, a good episode. I, like you, I like the character of Reg Barkley for his relatability. No, the less said about the actor, the better, given his politics, but we'll ignore oh, that. Oh, I have no idea, really? Yeah, uh, unfortunately. Oh, I was a day years old when Broccoli had gone stale. <laughs> 
Yeah, he's it's it's one of those uh, Kelsey Grammer situations, unfortunately. Right. <laughs> Don't tell me you didn't know that one either. <laughs> that no, no, really... no, no, yeah, Kelsey Grammer Grammar's awful. I, at least, yeah, I, you know, I don't, I don't need to be just ruined right here. You know, but <laughs> I, yeah. I did have a thing though. Uh, speaking of like the whole broccoli thing with him, um, I back in like the initial season of Discovery, just mm-hmm. we love Tilly, we stand Tilly all day. But I just got this vibe from watching her, just like you know, the timing works out. What if this is just Reg Barkley's grandmother? <laughs> what if that's who this is? What if this and is Grandma Barkley? So, <laughs> so the whole first, so that was my head cannon for like all the way until they made it to the thirty first century, thirty uh, second century, and um, it was that's clearly how this happened. So it was like Gammy Broccoli, no, or whatever the hell, and then <laughs> and then eventually shortened to like. Gambrox because you language mutate and so it's just it's like I I don't know it's like you know by by the time she's gone it's like oh I'm gonna miss you Gambrox it's like it doesn't even make sense anymore but just you know <laughs> I love it you've just created your own series though sure. <laughs> you know? why not sure. <laughs> you'll amuse an audience of at least one <laughs> yeah, right hey there you go you know <laughs> that's that's all you need. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> so, <laughs> getting back to a Pathfinder, though, like I said, I like how relatable the character, at least of Barkley, is. And they did the same thing they did with Next Gen, because Next Gen was basically just this dude is so depressed that he's spending all his time watching Star Trek. Yeah. <laughs> and Voyager, Voyager is just basically this dude is depressed and has no friends and is now obsessed with Voyager. So I was like, it's, it's just like they're watching me at this stage. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it was a cool idea. There was some nice humor. The idea of him calling his cat Neelix and stuff like that was pretty amusing. And yeah, uh, it's always good to see uh, to see Diana Troy as well. So it was yeah. cool that uh, for every time you have to have um, Reg Barkley appearing and Voyager, at least you've always got Diana Troy with him in every example of that. Yeah. So, and I also like his version of it because you know he's only working off of the data that they have off mm-hmm. of it, so they've still got Balana and um, oh my god, uh, you know, like in the um, in the Maquis uniforms and stuff. And yeah. the, the Maquis uniforms and everything. And I believe Harry's hair is wrong still because I'm sure they're working off of whatever fucking Academy photo they have of him. <laughs> uh, and it's just the right amount of not quite what we're used to, just to kind of just like, look at this freaking copy of Sim 4 we're watching. Okay. <laughs> When you think that would be kind of a nightmare, wouldn't it? If you, you went missing and then five years later, people just raked up an old photo of you and were like, let's just make a simulation of this person looking like this. Oh, all God. Me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, especially me, sweetie. We don't need any pictures of me from five years ago. We don't need, any <laughs> we don't need of pictures that. of me from five days ago. <laughs> oh, well, there we go. Well, well, let's just put it all in a pile and burn those fuckers down. We don't need them. Put them in the past. Rear view. Just use a use a random hologram template, Reg. I beg you, just pretend. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I will. Uh, I will do one more then for today um, on the hit or miss section, um, and it's a character who I'm getting some slight vibes of uh, of from you. <laughs> I hope you take that as a compliment and don't just immediately storm off. But it's the character of Ensign Devana Tendi from Lower Decks. <laughs> I love Tendi. Oh my god. Yeah. The enthusiasm on her and she's got a cool haircut. And just, oh yeah, absolutely. And the whole like, you know, I do like what they did with the whole, you know, it's like, hey, not every Orion is this like bloodthirsty libertarian gone mad. You know? <laughs> exactly, yeah. And yeah. now they're able to do that. Oh, we yeah, we love T- Tendi. We stand Tendi. Yes. Awesome. Yes, we big, big tendy energy. I like it. <laughs> yeah. Excited. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Same. I'm, yeah. I'm, always, I'm always a sucker for the character. That's probably why I like Tilly. Speaking of that, I'm a sucker for whichever character that's like, I just wow. love being here. I'm just happy to be here. <laughs> right. Right. Who? Who's Who's the enthusiasm factory? I will glom onto them. They are my people. <laughs> So. Exactly. Plus, for a cartoon, she's weirdly kind of cute. So, yeah. yeah, oh, absolutely. Makes my little gay heart flutter. I'm, mm, <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, it's just, just fun, funny, amusing, and like all of the, well, at least most of the lower decks ones, quite relatable in like, oh, bless her, she's trying. 
<laughs> I mean, I think I'm probably more like Boimler, like just put upon and groaning and like, oh, just, I'm trying. Just a tendy who's like, oh, well, we'll try again tomorrow. Never mind. Really, there you go. I had to shave off a couple of points for execution, but that enthusiasm is right where it needs to be, friend. There we go. Awesome. <laughs> well, that's fair enough. Uh, great. Well, that concludes the, the hit or miss section then. We're, we're making our way through. So uh, without any further ado, I will um, deal with the, the issue at hand, which is the episode we're reviewing this week, uh, okay. which is the reason why we're here. And that, of course, as I mentioned, uh, the rather famous episode, The Measure of a Man from Star Trek The Next Generation. And mm -hmm. I will begin analysis of the episode. Analysis. Mr. Um. I have a few fast facts before I get into kind of reviewing the episode and breaking it down and stuff. But before that, <laughs> I was just going to ask you uh, if you had to describe the measure of a man as spoiler free as possible uh, to somebody who had never heard it or, or seen it. What, what would you say about the episode and, and in your reaction to it? <laughs> a person from data's past shows up to fuck things up and make you think about humanity. OK. And uh, yeah, does quite a good job at, uh, at, at the deep stuff, I think, as well. So. But there again, you go. We'll, we'll deal with that later. Um, right. So, yeah, what I've been doing then, as I said, uh, before starting the full review of this series, I'm just hitting a few fast facts that I've been able to find from just random research. Uh, mm -hmm. Apologies if they bore you, just skip ahead five minutes, but I find them oh, quite yeah. intriguing. Um, and the first one is uh, that The Measure of a Man was the writer Melinda Snodgrass's first TV credit. Uh, she drew from her own experience as an attorney when writing the episode, and she commented on it that everyone seems to view it as a data script, but it's really a Picard script. Data is the catalyst, but the stress is all on Picard. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah the, uh, the way he's got to, like, roll through this and just, just like, the fuck am I going to do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see where she's coming from, and I can't really tell her what her writing is but for me it is still very much a data episode since it's essentially dealing with his rights i mean yeah. oh sure uh, absolutely um well i guess it, it's one of those like like data is the point of it but he mm. is you know i guess you watch picard do the work of getting to there but data has been there and is the subject of this so i can kind of yeah. get where she you know that perspective that that, that you know makes sense he he, you yeah. know, he, he starts off going, well, to, you know, being right back in there I, at the I, end. I, yeah, I get where she's coming from in terms of if you're looking at it as like Picard is the, the Atticus Finch, I guess, of the story, if you want to do that. But yeah, there I mean, there's, there's too much extra little nuances and stuff that she gives data for you to disregard that he's the main character because we deal with like the his innermost stuff. I mean, we'll get to it, but like we deal with who he's been intimate with and stuff. And it's like, this is deep things we're getting into but yeah anyway <laughs> um the second of my facts then in a comment on her blog uh melinda snodgrass recalls how gene roddenberry nearly shot down the story uh, as to the issue of law in gene's vision he nearly killed the measure of a man because according to gene there are no lawyers in the 24th century because if people had criminal intentions they had their minds made right um, I've, Melinda said, I found that chilling. I also pointed out that you have contracts that have to be negotiated and conflicts of law between different legal systems, divorces, etc. There's no way there would be no lawyers in the future. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Gene Roddenberry had a lot of those, you know, yeah. high on supply kind of ideas at the end. <laughs> yeah. Very much. I don't like lawyers, so forget it. And, yeah. Right. And no interpersonal conflict. Yeah, oh, which doesn't really work, does it? Doesn't make for a most exciting TV. But, yeah, anyway. right, but hey, no interpersonal conflict, no lawyers, but at all times, horny as all get out. Not sexy, mind you, <laughs> but horny. It's very I, not, certainly not monogamous. You know, as many partners oh, as you like. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. Monogamy <laughs> suckers anyway. What are you doing? Keep your options open out there. There's billions of people out there. Why are you? What, what are you gonna find one? What are you? What are you doing? Play the play. No, no, play no, the no. numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Uh, the uh, the third fact I have is that uh, this is a bit geeky, but the courtroom set was actually a redress of the Enterprise D Battle Bridge. Um, yes, <laughs> I don't wow. know. The scurry part is I did I, I don't know if I, that was ever in the back of my head, but I was I was rewatching it for this. Like I had not like I hadn't seen it like fifty times before, but like it's been <laughs> like, so. And you want to keep it fresh in your brain, and it's like near like the last ten minutes of it. It was like. This looks fucking familiar. 
Hmm. <laughs> and he said, showed up. This is a like I, I figured it was either like a battle bridge or like whatever the fuck they do for any like older ship, whatever you know, like Miranda <laughs> class obereth piece of ancient tissue paper or duct tape and a hope put together kind of sack of crap that you could just yeah, i'm pretty sure the stog is a bridge was just the battle bridge but slightly yeah regretful. probably it was probably just the same fucking battle bridge for all of it because you know you got to make it just gray and sad enough to look depressing exactly. next to the beautiful tan carpeted wonderland that is in a galaxy class bridge that's just Oh, I wouldn't even wear shoes. That's how nice it looks on a galaxy class bridge. Just fucking get the toesies in there. It's designed for comfort. What are you doing? Step out of your broken down 1960s Ford and come into the lobby of this luxury 80s hotel. That's yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. exactly it. <laughs> you nailed it. Uh, yeah. Uh, speaking of that set, though, it also featured a map of the galaxy previously seen in Conspiracy. Uh, the mm -hmm. episode that we don't talk about, and a chart that showed the current location of 24 starships. Uh, the model of Starbase 173 was, of course, a reuse of regular one from Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, because right. it's exactly the same. <laughs> yeah. it's, you had it sitting there, you know, don't, don't, don't worry your pretty little head over everything, you know. Take yeah, exactly. It. it looked quite nice, actually. The Enterprise-D alongside it sort of works really cool as a little image. So yeah, yeah, it's a good ritual. It's solid. It all <laughs> it all makes sense. It all looks nice. That's fair. Nice. Uh, uh, fact number four, then uh, the last of my official facts is that Admiral Nakamura tells Picard that Starbase One Hundred Seventy Three is newly established in response to disturbances along the Federation Romulan neutral zone, which were first referenced in the episode "The Neutral Zone." These disturbances will later be revealed to be early attacks by the Borg. So you see, it fits uh, all the themes. <laughs> it's still about the Borg, kind of. <laughs> look, look, we put a check in every box. <laughs> exactly. Uh, the only other thing I have is, and I did this um, in my uh, review of The Raven with Linda. Um, this is not me decrying the episode, but I do find it amusing sometimes to the little continuity errors and stuff that slip through. Uh, mm -hmm. In this episode specifically, contradicts a statement made by Pulaski in Where Silence Has Least that Data is listed as alive in his Starfleet personnel file. Uh, because now all of a sudden he's not. So, <laughs> because the story wouldn't work otherwise. But, yeah. um, before I get into the episode proper, then the last thing I wanted to mention is that uh, this episode does have an extended edition on the Next Generation Season 2 Blu-ray set. Uh, mm -hmm. A significant amount of footage was cut from the episode during editing, but it was restored for the, the season two Blu-ray. The extended edition runs 57 minutes wrong, 57 minutes long, sorry, uh, with around 14 minutes of restored scenes and effects. Um, it's huh. not the version I'll be commenting on because it's not the most readily available if people are watching along with us on streaming services or anything like that. But right. I do highly recommend that version because it's all of the extra stuff is actually really good. Uh, so if oh. you have to get the, the season two Blu-ray and watch that, definitely do do it. <laughs> Well, I'm with the rest rest of the rooms that gotta go hunt that out now, because I didn't know that was a thing. How, I'm sure every time I've seen it on like Netflix or Paramount, it's been like the standard one where all you see. So I'm, I'm Oh yeah, it's only available on the, the Blu-ray set and the extended version because the only reason they've got it is um funny. yeah, the episode writer Melinda Snodgrass kept a video of like the rough cut. So they had to upscale it from like VHS that she'd had hidden in her loft for years. <laughs> Ooh, that sounds rough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it looks, I mean, it's perfect now. Obviously, they've got oh, a million yeah. things they can do, but um, yeah, they definitely really worth a look at. every last pixel out of it now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't want to get into too much about what's been added because there are, there's a lot of stuff that just adds like flavor to the characters and stuff. But one thing that I do think it is a shame that we lose is that there's a scene where Riker is with Picard and they're kind of discussing the trial. And it points out that Riker, for want of a better way of seeing it, his kind of competitive nature is getting the best of him so he's it's kind of explaining that he's thinking of it as i've got to beat the card as opposed to i've got to basically you know sacrifice my friend uh, as so, yeah. trying to go some way to explain like why are you doing this man i mean i know you've got to but still you know? right. <laughs> but, uh, yeah it, i mean it still doesn't fully work but at least it gives it a little bit better of context than just like what what are you doing do you honestly right. will? yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah awesome um so then did you have any sort of uh quick thoughts or anything before we get into the meat of the episode or no 
Uh, I, I don't know. It, it's, you know, it, it's something that's been covered a lot, but at the same time, it, it is, it is kind of interesting to, to kind of go back and look at it with a different lens. Like I, mm. I know certainly like I, I watched all of this stuff a gender mm. ago and, 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 <laughs> And I have since rewatched most of it with, you know, with, with more modern eyes. And in, the things that you pick up on and notice, and, and you mean and since not being a since not being a white male, you've realized that some people have to fight for rights. Just a bit, yeah. It's amazing what happens when they knock you off the top of the fucking totem pole, huh? Oh. <laughs> yeah, I, I can learn. imagine. <laughs> Oh yeah. What I'll do, I'll just kind of go scene by scene, and if there's anything you want to chime in on, or um, do you think I've missed, or skipped over, or whatever, you just kind of shout it out, and we'll go back to it um, from there. Um, so yeah, the very first thing then is the um, the first occurrence of the regularly seen poker game. Uh, this is the first time it appeared in the show, which I didn't realize watching it back. Oh, that was the very um, first one. Yeah, apparently so. Um, and I just love data is such a rube. He's wearing the like little uh, poker. <laughs> Like he's clearly like oh, the, yeah. the, the he's read up on poker and he's like I'm going to play and I'm going to win. And then it's obviously just completely schooled by Riker's amazing bluffing talents because I don't think Riker's ever lost a hand in any of those poker games that I've watched. Right. Oh, um, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> although he, he yeah. might to Shelby at some point, but yeah. Anyway, <laughs> data has got big Boy Scout uh, energy throughout the entire yeah. series. <laughs> but it is, I mean, it's it obviously it could be used to just well, it's setting up the crew dynamics and it's just getting you into the episode, but it also immediately gets you into the whole like the nature of instinct versus machine logic, which is referenced later because when data says like there's something about living an experience that's completely different to just remembering it. And I read yeah. everything about poker, but I still wasn't prepared for the reality of playing it, you know, so exactly and, and the differentiation there, and and completely. you know, like. It's still, you know, that early like data trying to mesh with the crew, and and mm. and they're doing their best, but alas, are humans, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, speaking of arguments, we are introduced to uh, Philippa Louvois, uh, <laughs> to which I've just written a note, Picard, you old dog. <laughs> What's been going on here? <laughs> right, right. They're, yeah, they. <laughs> It's like, oh wait, romance subplot. All right, sure, sure, sure. Uh, Not even yeah, just a romance so, though. It's like it's it's the ultimate Mills and Boone attempt to do Wuthering Heights of like, yo, know, you know what I what I said I would do if I found you, bust a chair off my head, and I'll kiss you, and then do that or whatever. It's like, yeah, really. Is, is this they were trying to have a little bit of that going, and it just, you know, <laughs> like it's like if anything's a miss for the episode, it's that. Uh, I, I think trying to have that that kind of you know maybe so, but I almost I, I almost give it a pass just because I love I absolutely love the line. Um, it gives me comfort to know that you're still a pompous ass and a damn sexy man. <laughs> 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 it's one of those lines that's so it's like it could have been written by Tommy Wiseau, you know, <laughs> but it's just yeah, a little bit. It's it's a little. <laughs> It's it's it, it's kind of a lot, a little bit. <laughs> we do actually get uh, told that there's a lot of backstory there between those two as well. That she was the one that kind of prosecuted him after the loss of the Stargazer, uh, mm -hmm. going back into the kind of first season. So that's all backstory you don't really need, but I guess it's kind of nice if you've been following the show. Um, yeah, absolutely, it's yeah. it's nice to have that, you know. And uh, and you know, you get the little. Certainly, we appreciate it. You know, having yeah. That. yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it, it does give you the stakes of like when she's the one who's ultimately deciding things and you know that she's not come down on Picard's side once in the past. It's like, ooh, tension. So <laughs> brilliant. Um, then obviously the Admiral uh, Nakamura and Maddox are touring the Enterprise D. Uh, and there's some good direction here because I like how the camera shows Maddox staring at Data and Data just noticing, just like, what the fuck are you looking at? <laughs> Without even seeing anything, it's just a look of like I can I can feel your eyes in the back of oh, my head. What, what's going? On? Oh, it is a vibe. The <laughs> moment he walks in, the it's shit is up. The the tingling <laughs> on the back of the neck, 
The his spider sense. Like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. He he he's tangled with this fucker before, and he's loath to do it again. Yeah. Uh, and it's just, you know, and like even before it's obvious, and the music changes, you can just mm. kind of feel it. The way he circles all the way around the back part of the bridge, and yeah, he's playing yep. walk and talk, but he's looking, and throughout the whole episode, yeah. I the think guy it's, playing it's, Maddox, it's just like, yeah, it's like a guy who wears his emotions on his face being told, you can't do that. <laughs> you can't do that. But he says, a... okay. And he tries, but it's just, it's, he's not good. He's not good. It's just, it's just there, there was one scene. I'm sure that fucker was stifling a giggle. <laughs> It's in a way though. I think it's good casting because there's something you probably wouldn't appreciate me saying this, but there's something already kind of slimy about that actor. So, oh, yeah. so it's kind of oh he's, yeah. He's, oh, he's got a very really, absolutely. That's what <laughs> that's what sells him being yeah. such a piece of shit. That's <laughs> exactly. just absolutely like to the point where when he when um when they brought the character back in Picard, I, I kind of wish there is there is like a line of just you just I don't know. I don't know how you'd be able to fold it in. I, I just wanted to just like, yeah, it was a real piece of shit back then. Just like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, that's fair enough. But yeah, obviously we, we learn, uh, despite all this, we have reason to hate Maddox because he opposed uh, Data's entrance to the Academy on the grounds that he's not sentient. Uh, and now he wants to disassemble Data to replicate Dr. Soong's work, mm. uh, which weirdly, side note, he is going to eventually do the first season of Picard, but... That's many moons away at this point. Uh, <laughs> there's something very kind of modern and of the now that didn't occur to me until the, re the most recent rewatch of this episode that this motherfucker doesn't even respect pronouns. Constantly no. refers to data as it. <laughs> it's like, yo, well, dude. <laughs> not cool. <laughs> oh, oh, absolutely. And definitely that's what they're trying to do with this. Now, much love to my friends who use it, its pronouns. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I, I, I have friends who use it, it's pronouns. If, if that's you, then baby, do you, I, uh, that's, yeah. that's, that's what makes you feel the most like you. Well, there you go. Um, but yeah, definitely there was, you know, uh, I wasn't going to do this cause it feels so fucking obvious, but we're going to do it anyway. Obvious trans analogies are obvious all throughout this episode. Ah, <laughs> Holy crap! But it, it, it feels like I think it's worth thing. doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You, you already got me on here. You might as well have me talk about that shit. Um, well, yeah. Jack comments on a lot of things, doesn't it? It's always been socially conscious, and I don't think it's just trans. I think there's a lot of, and we'll get into it later. There's an awful lot of coding as kind of, um, you know, black Americans and slavery and all that as well. Okay. Um, well, you know, it's, do, it's, do they have rights? Or <laughs> yeah, it, it's one of those where, like, you know, there, there's. There's a lot of tools in the oppression toolbox, yeah. and a lot of times some of those get reused on multiple groups of people. And so it's very easy to be able to make these kind of comparisons because they're not exactly the same, but they generally do tend to come from the same top-down kind of place. Mm. And uh, and so, yeah, it's very easy to kind of, you know, kind of look a lot at that. Like throughout the whole trial, yeah, with the pronouns, the whole dehumanization thing yes. where yeah, yeah, yeah. like and just they they're talking about his processing speed they're talking about like strength things like that uh mm. they're they're reducing him to a pile of parts yeah. what 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 do people ask trans people sometimes oh like yeah. maybe about <laughs> and 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 hormones and how like well, oh, even even the yeah. I mean, again, I, I don't, not to get too far into it, but even stuff like look at the incredible strength this person has. You know, mm -hmm. there's a, a analogy currently doing the rounds yet again of like trans women can't compete in female sports; they have an advantage, and it's like exactly. Oh, <laughs> stuff. oh yeah, just uh, and and uh, we we could we could go down a rabbit hole for twenty minutes on it, but it's just yeah. it's just. Transphobia and oppression again. They do yeah. not care about women's sports. Hell, the whole reason yeah. we have women's sports was it was just sports, and then women got too good at it, and so they barred them, and then they made their own separate category. <laughs> like we yeah. should just have sports. 
Speaking of which, though, I'm sure the next scene is probably an analogy for something, but it went over my head, which I am uh, slightly ashamed to admit. But it's basically when they've explained what's going to happen and Data and Picard are in the ready room and Data sort of gives this weird analogy of like, um, if they made every one of you have the upgrades to your eyes that LaForge has to see better, would would you do it? And would it be fair? And I was like, I'm not sure what you're getting at here. <laughs> right. Where it's, where, yeah, where it's just like, well, you know, Jordy's eyes are technically like the best eyes. Why don't you make everybody have those? And he's just like, oh, I see. Uh, yeah. It's, it, you know, it is, it is exactly... You know, it's like, it's not, I don't think it's a perfect analogy, no, uh, no. but it is, it is definitely speaking to, it's like, oh, because of how you value yourselves versus how you treat me, mm. you know, you're, you, this is why you wouldn't inflict, you know, robot eyes on, on all of Starfleet. Yeah. Um, just the way you view personal autonomy and how these decisions are made and stuff like that, you know, definitely. It's like, why, why, if you're, you know, then why are you forcing me into doing that if you're not giving everybody the Geordie upgrade? So, yeah, and that's what I, the whole point of it is basically just to get you to, you know, it's precisely because I'm not human, which, as you say, can be used yeah. as a metaphor or an allegory for whatever you want to, to read into yeah. it or on a literal sense to kind of to, to spark whatever this trial is going to be in the episode. So, yeah, um, to that end, it's kind of makes sense and it does lead directly into like Picard trying to understand this legal gobbledygook and everything and him taking on the the kind of Atticus Finch role as uh, his defender um yes. and you know it's it's so it's such a good scene and it's awesome that Picard is like it's it's really important to me he has rights and stuff but I'm like is there a reason given other than just well Picard's a nice guy <laughs> not that that necessarily has to be but it did kind of come out of left field as like hmm <laughs> yeah. I don't know just general you know good in principle daddy Picard he only does good things like yeah you know i it's you it does feel a little just written into the script just as a thing that happens uh yeah. i'm i'm a little kind of fine with that like i'm kind maybe, of fine with it too it's just i would have liked a little bit of maybe like well he's my friend because it's like the, the right. whole sort of trial and everything skirts around picard not seeing that ever and it's like that's kind of a key thing that you could bring up is like you know regardless of anything else people's you know yeah. relationship to other people is important and there are a lot of people who would consider data a friend and that is an important thing do you know what i mean so i think yeah. it's one of those where like i guess if the implication is just like well of course that's what he does because that's what people do in this modern 24th century we're all better people which mm. would work if i don't know most everybody else wasn't a chuckle fuck not doing that, you know, kind yeah, of well, yeah. that, that is still kind of rare. So yeah. yeah, no, maybe, maybe some preface. He didn't just, you know, you know, get to there all on his love. So maybe, I don't know. Yeah. I think it kind of also has to show you that um, Picard isn't just out for vengeance against his ex, because there's an awful lot of, they'd still feel the need to put that in there when she's like, Oh, it means a lot. You came to me. And he's like, well, you can't even say the word trust to me. Can you? And, I was like, yeah, you kind of have to, I guess, have that other stuff so that it doesn't just feel like he's bitter at his ex. Because <laughs> then you'd be like, you don't care about his rights. <laughs> you just don't like this bitch. <laughs> right, exactly. Like, you know, this, yeah. this is this is the banner you're flying under, so you could do that heinous shit. You know, yeah. that's all it is. Fair enough. Um, so, yeah, obviously, Data has decided to try and resign as, as you know, to, I guess, the last ditch attempt to see what rights he has. Um, and as he's packing in his room, we get the first appearance of the Tasha Yar hologram, which is a very awe moment um, and yeah. a clear example of sentiment uh, for the viewer. If you're watching along and sort of is this is this being alive? Um, mm -hmm. Because, yeah, sentiment is a pretty key thing, I would say. Um, right. Then, uh, obviously, Bruce Maddox busts into the room unannounced and starts reading from some kind of poetry or something deep uh, and asks Data if he even fathoms the meaning of the words. Right. Oh, <laughs> Which... he strolls in like the sentient bag of dicks he is and just starts thumbing <laughs> through his personal items. Just, my I love God, it, though, because he asks this really rude question and Data's response in the very Data way is just... It is not because it's not customary to knock before entering somewhere. Right. And I'm like, a translation from data ease, bitch, you better knock. Right. <laughs> I feel like they want you to come away from this episode thinking this Bruce Maddox guy has no friends. Just <laughs> absolutely not. This, this, 
don't hand this guy the map. He doesn't know what a boundary is, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's why he gets on so well with machines. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, then obviously this is where we get data saying, um, as Maddox tries to convince him, your memories would be intact, it would be fine. But data says it would just be the mere facts and the essence would be lost. Uh, and I love this phrase, the ineffable quality. Um, and as I said, he compares it to like playing poker is very different than reading the rules and such. Uh, fascinating, really deep stuff. I like it. Um, and yeah, Maddox and uh, Data's debate about how data is the culmination of one man's dream and it's his duty to protect that. And Maddox thinking that's what he's doing. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, a lovely little Star Trek back and forth speechifying going on there. Um, so I, I like that scene personally, is the headline, I guess. And uh, yeah, what about you? Other than Maddox being a git, which I suppose is the point, what, what did you think of the, oh, the data yeah. scene? God, yeah. just that That's really like during the trial, like especially where he's just sitting there going, they told me not to be obvious, but I want to giggle. Just like after Riker finishes. Just like, <laughs> I'm winning. I'm winning. Exactly. Just, yeah. Just like, oh, fucking imp. You know, that's fair enough. Um, and yeah, continuing the Maddox is the worst thing. Uh, the very next scene is them deciding whether or not to convene a trial. And Maddox, <laughs> it's so rude. Like, oh, if, if it was a box on wheels, I wouldn't be facing these kinds of. Right. Yeah, but bitch, it's not. That's a ridiculous argument. <laughs> I don't understand that. <laughs> what if the Enterprise refused to refit? Well, this this ain't the same shit. And then later on, they do have an episode where it's kind of similar <laughs> shit. You know, where they yeah. and shit. And then they have that question. It's like, well. Yeah. But I, it's just such a it's such a stupid straw man argument from Maddox. If this lawsuit uh, was against the wheelbarrow, I wouldn't have any of these. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> It's so awesome, though, that um, the, the Admiral sort of points out that Picard isn't really prone to over-sentimentality. Um, mm -hmm. And he talks about, like, for the first time, what about the idea of every ship with a data on board? Uh, it's not fair because these synthetic life forms would have rights. And then Maddox does the ultimate douchey kid who deserves a slap thing. What about my right? <laughs> <laughs> oh! What about me? <laughs> <laughs> Is there ever a worse phrase than what about my right? That really is all lives matter for the track freaking generation. Yes. <laughs> oof, uh, oof. Yeah. About my yeah. right. There are no white people in this show. It's not fair. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <sighs> um, yeah, so they decide obviously to take the case because Picard has been quite convincing, uh, but Data is still sort of officially resigned and leaving so there's a little um brief scene in 10 forward to get the rest of the main cast into at least one scene <laughs> where he's uh he's doing the like uh if you unwrap carefully you can he's, he's basically being my mum when it comes to wrapping me yeah. up you know if you don't it, we can reuse it later but um yeah wesley talks him out of it and it's, uh i think it, again it's an important scene because it shows that he can learn adapt and ignore like rigorous logic because once wesley points out like it's, it's just have fun it, it, just do it he's like okay let's go with it um and then similarly laforge is just devastated uh, and says you know it's not fair to which data says life really is and oh. they talk about how much they'll miss each other um i'm sure there's queer coding in there <laughs> but oh, i just sweetie sweetie <laughs> they are boyfriends and just <laughs> oh that's the, that's how i've read them the not not the entire time but certainly mm. ever since i figured out you know this whole situation <laughs> I, I i've, I've been reading that and, and it's just like you know the way i kind of view it is is you know you're what you're the head canon i sometimes have is these episodes are constructed from the logs and the journal entries and so you have the episode but the real shit might have been you know messier or, or or more complex and things like that and so so that's the that's the log version and <laughs> and, and 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 the real version is is jordy is very sad because his boyfriend's going away and it's not fair and <laughs> and you can just see oh my god and the one thing that's preserved throughout all of it just the look on jordy's fucking face oh yeah. god and god he tried and that man tries to compet so hard throughout this entire show maybe i'll make a hologram of this scientist that i like and be weird to her you know and just yeah. 
I'm not getting into that. <laughs> that's, a yeah, whole that's, that's a whole different episode. We are here to talk yeah. about one episode. But yeah, I do like that kind of in the way that uh, Trek can be a lot of things to a lot of people. I just related to that scene because I've had friends move away and stuff. And, oh, um, yeah. you know, it's, it is kind of sad when that happens, which isn't to, to kind of deny it and be like, they're not gay. How dare you? Oh, no. it's just... <laughs> but, but it can be relatable in other ways. It isn't necessarily, you know, my boyfriend's leaving. But yeah, it could, it could definitely yeah. have just that. Yeah, my friend's moving away or just, you know. Or like your workmates getting fucking promoted or getting another job. Or yeah. Like that, well, just just the frustration about lack of rights and stuff as well. Like I'm I'm sad you're going, and I'm also frustrated as fuck that you're being made to go because it's not your choice, you know. Um, yeah. So yeah, fair enough. Yeah, it's decided that Data is the property of Starfleet, uh, to which Picard obviously appeals, and a case is convened. But being a new starbase, they have to use the Enterprise's senior staff, which means that mm-hmm. Riker's forced to be the prosecutor in possibly the only really dumb part of the episode um yeah. he says he'd uh, you know he says he'd resist because data is his friend but then she points out she'd have to rule summarily and data is a toaster because she's a bitch apparently <laughs> so, and uh yeah just this this she she had... follow the rules man <laughs> The sheer lunacy, though, of just, if you're not doing your best, if I sense you're not doing your best, I'll end it here and now. It's just, it's so stupid, because of course he isn't giving it. You can't force somebody to turn off the... Oh, forget it. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it does have a very, it does have a bit of a paternalistic kind of a vibe to it, doesn't it? Yeah, but it's it's just ultimately, isn't it? It's just fascist. It's like, yo, I, I want you to remember that I hold all the cards here, so if at any point I decide you're not doing a good enough job, Tough shit, you know. It's like, well, that's not justice. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, <laughs> um, Data is completely resigned to this, it seems, but you know they're going to appeal. Um, and Data says that he, you know, he's got great confidence in Picard, which is um, a really nice scene between the two of them, uh, explaining that Picard's going to be his counsel. And we briefly see Riker in the cut down version, at least, accessing Data's schematics and finding the Chekhov's off switch that he's going to be using later. Yes, yes. Oh, that was that's a that's some uh, solid Frakes acting right there. That's a, <laughs> that's a two takes Frakes original. Is what that is. Uh, yay! Yes, I indeed. found it. Oh no, I found it uh, <laughs> in one smooth motion of happy to sad. It's oh. just like there's it's like it's good, but it is also a little much. Just, just a but little. Again, just, though, the plot kind of demands that because it's such a stupid yeah. idea from the off of just oh, like, absolutely. give it but your it's all. Like, <laughs> it's like two squirts more mustard than it needs. Right? Yeah, okay. I, I, it's I guess. Yeah. Up, you know. I suppose this but, this still is only season two of Next Gen as well, so <laughs> they're, yeah. they're still finding their feet. Bless them. I mean, <laughs> yeah. he just grew that beard. Yes, oh. exactly. <laughs> like just. We just got here. This is still baby beard Riker. He's still growing into himself here. You know, he's he's, exactly. he's getting there. He's getting there. He's <laughs> he still hasn't fought his father. Yeah, uh, you know, it's like we 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 got time to work oh, on some shit. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh, well. But uh, that we'll do a retrospective of Riker someday, but <laughs> but not today. Um, so yeah, uh, convening the hearing. Obviously, we get um, we've discussed a lot of this already. But reading Picard insists on them reading Data's list of achievements, as I guess to kind of emphasize uh, the things he's done that the mere machine perhaps couldn't. And uh, asks for the definition of what are you? You're an android. That means you are made by a human. And then, as you said, just reducing to what's your memory capacity? What can you do? And uh, you should bend this bit of steel. Um, to which Picard, his objection to that is there are a lot of life forms with it, super strength. It's not relevant. And the judge says, oh, oh it is relevant. Mega strength, <laughs> which always struck me as a little weird. That like, <laughs> that's the, this is, this is, this, this, this is a courtroom. So like, like that's, that's the official <laughs> term that, that Starfleet is using is mega strength. Mega like, strength. like, like, like we're six year olds with action figures. And I kind of fucking love that. Maybe it was a tie-in. Maybe the date that actually did come with mega strength kung fu grip. Right, right. <laughs> with mega well, strength I mean... and kung fu grip, you know? Sure. <laughs> the Why thing not? that bugged me, uh, the thing that bugged me about this though is that she 
decides, no, it's not irrelevant and it's perfectly fine. And I'm like, but it is irrelevant. Picard's right. Because there are multiple super strong life forms. It doesn't prove a damn thing. Yeah, it's not <laughs> uh -huh. How can you just hand wave it away? Like, oh, no, no, it's, it's cool. We're fine with it. Um, but anyway, I think that they're being quite small minded, shall we say. Um, mm. There's a reference to law, which I guess is nice again, if you've been following the series. Um, and Riker tries to prove now uh, his point by taking off Data's hand. Like, oh, look, I can disassemble this being. <laughs> to which I also made the note of, if I remember correctly, in the animated series and now Lower Decks, there was an alien species that can split into three. And they're not yes. machines. <laughs> so, yes. So again, awesome. you've proved yeah, nothing. They, <laughs> they, they do some really excellent callbacks on Lower Decks. And that is one of my favorite ones. Is they actually went, <laughs> went in. They was like, yeah, we're going to use this one that splits apart. And we're we're gonna we're gonna use it, and it why not? Sure. But yeah, by this point, it's like there'd, there'd be life forms that can detach parts as well. That again proves nothing. Um, but then obviously Riker brings out his uh, his ace in the hole. You know, uh, it was created by a man, and a man will shut it off. And he turns him off and says, "Pinocchio is broken." Um, now, to me, this still isn't conclusive because theoretically, you could just knock anybody out. That's all you've done. You know yeah. I mean? <laughs> Pretty much, it just data has a convenient button about it. But like otherwise, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I mean, like if if I was in a courtroom and was like, "Watch when I whack this person over the head with a hammer." <clears throat> look, look, I've yeah. deactivated them. <laughs> <laughs> of course you have. <laughs> uh, anyway. <laughs> Um, yeah, the next was... scene I did want to talk about um, because it's my favourite of the episode and I love it. It's when basically Guinan comes in to steal the entire episode because Guinan and Picard yeah. are discussing, you know, uh, this fantastic speech about, you know, um, th this is about slavery. I think it's a little harsh. I don't think it's harsh. I think it's the truth, but we've obscured it behind the name of property and, you know, um, mm -hmm. I'll get the full speech out later because it's it, it will come up in my kind of best of the episode at the end, but it's oh, fantastic yeah. and sums up everything perfectly. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, Picard, again, making all of the sense, though, when they reconvene, because he points out, look, we are just machines, but of a different type. So, you know, I'm not denying the facts of the, everything that's been presented here, but it's completely not relevant. You know, you say it was created by a man. Children are created by the DNA of their parents, you know. So right. exactly. Picard's just nailing it for me. Um, right. And then He's like, this is irrelevant. This is irrelevant. Why? <laughs> you, you know, it's like almost specifically kind of droll the way he lays that out. Just as like, this, yeah, it, it, you, your razzle dazzle is boring. You're boring me. <laughs> you know. <laughs> like oh, if only that had been how it had went. But <laughs> I would have enjoyed. Yo, that. Riker, you bore me. <laughs> you bore me. Ah, you boint. <laughs> <laughs> but no, again, Picard brings out his absolute trump card by pointing out that um, Data, when he thought he was leaving, was packing and took medals with him, uh, to which yeah. Picard asks, well, what's the point? It's not logical. And Data says, well, I don't know. I just wanted them. Is that vanity? And I'm like, see, that's it's almost as if they'd planned that because you couldn't find a better example of being alive than literally asking questions, especially something that deep, damn it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh. And I just, you know, I do kind of, the, just the the innocence of that question and yeah. the way he posed it. You, you just like, I, I involuntarily awe, but I was like, Oh yeah, honey. Well, yeah, <laughs> no, I, I get that hundred percent. Yeah, completely. Um, you know. But yeah, they, they keep on piling on that sentiment though. Cause then it's like, what, what about this book? It was a gift from you. It's a reminder of friendship and service. Um, and what about this hologram of Tasha? You don't have any of your other crewmates. Um, I promised I wouldn't say it. I think under the circumstances, she'd be fine. She was special to me. We were intimate. And everyone just seems floored by this. And then um, Riker's like, um, there'll be no cross-examination. And I'm like, hang on, this bitch was like, better give it your all here. He's like, ah, I've got nothing to say back. And she's not like, well, try. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I did it, they made it a point. Like, they even had that point where, uh, I don't know, what's her face? She Where, where she's like, oh, shit, she fucked that robot. And then she just looked like her. <laughs> and then Riker's like, yeah, yeah, that's a thing. That's a thing. No words, but that's the entire conversation. She fucked that robot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was, and that was the whole deal. Just, just, uh, you know, because you can't, because you can't let that shit lie, can you? You can't just, you know, acknowledge it and move on. You've got to at least cut to somebody going. 
somebody boned the droid. Uh, it's it's <laughs> the, you gotta you gotta spend. I mean, time. it is it is pretty funny though. <laughs> yeah, good time. Yeah, like I'm, I don't know. I I am a bit of a bait creature in that way, and yeah, I I too guffawed. <laughs> Yeah, I, see, I didn't even, I was too busy sucked up in the sentiment of it that it didn't occur to me. But now, picturing the scene back, you're right, the Admiral does just give a face. The card calls Maddox as a hostile witness. And yeah. uh, th th again, completely just genius writing and uh, delivery of it is like, well, what are your criteria for sentience, you know? Um, and then he proceeds to prove that Data has them all. He's, yes, he's intelligent. You know, he's got... Um, self-awareness he knows who he is and so if he, i can prove consciousness and even the slightest bit can anybody really define what he is and we have to be prepared to do that because we're talking about rights for an entire race down the way so right. and we're going to be we're going to be judged by how we treat that race yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's just like tell how how do you know i'm certain shit huh see what do yeah. you think now chuckle fuck this is a nebulous question you're right you know <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. But I do, uh, I find it really weird, though, that completely by accident, because obviously it wouldn't have been planned. Picard's words here are basically season one of Picard. <laughs> like, we will be judged by how we treat this race of synthetic people. Oh, shit, yeah. that's exactly what that was about, wasn't it? There you go. <laughs> Consistency. We got it. Anyway, um, yeah, so obviously, as I said, Picard deals with, you know, how we regard these creations of our genius as important and it'll have far-reaching consequences. We can't condemn them to slavery. Um, and again, the, the glorious line of uh, Starfleet was founded to seek out new life. Well, there it sits. <laughs> That's Here a mic drop. Are, fuck face. Yeah. Just, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and then, yeah, Louvois just giving it all the drama that her name suggests. Is like, it looks at me and I don't know what it is. These are big questions. But no, it's not property. Uh, we're dancing around the issue. Does it have a soul? Does anyone? Right, which, uh, <laughs> I never liked that. That's a that's a miss. Uh, does he have a soul? Oh, shut up! This is the twenty fourth century. Oh, I like that. <laughs> I it's like I know what you're getting at. There has to be a better way to do that than to just. Oh, I don't mind it. I'm fine with it. Uh, I'm fine with it because they don't... It's not like they immediately point out that she's like, yes, I believe there is. It's like, does he have a soul? No, but like anybody else, they deserve the right to explore that question for themselves. And yeah. I'm like, okay, that's, that's I'm fine with. So I do. I love that the kind of the way that's explained. As somebody who kind of has that belief, I guess it maybe rings a little bit truer with me, but I like the fact that she's not like, we rule, there is such a thing as a soul, he's got one. It's like, we rule that he has the freedom to explore what existence is just like anything else that we consider alive and yeah. uh, to me that's that's a very fundamental trek type principle and I, I'm, I'm on board for that um, yeah absolutely so yeah i think that's brilliant and i like that data then immediately just walks up and formally refuses the procedure and right. it's just such a although data doesn't have emotions we the audience are feeling such a like oh punch the end moment when he goes up and he's like i refuse your procedure but uh continue your work i'll still be here when you've actually done work that you know it's good enough and you're not quite a shit so right. what, a, what a flex. What a exactly. flex. Exactly oh, right, yeah. My God. It's like, yeah. oh, you let me know when you work out the kinks, okay? <laughs> and then just chunk deuce, you know. I'll take <laughs> a look at your work, and if it doesn't totally suck, then we'll look at it from there, you know. Right. But, uh, yeah, I love it. I love that um, it's so hokey and cheesy, and it absolutely shouldn't be a, like, everything is redeemed moment. But it is still weirdly beautiful, and it still gets me when Maddox says he's remarkable, and Louvois goes, "Oh, you called him he instead of it," and I was like, right. "Oh, damn it! It shouldn't get me, but it still does." <laughs> Which, uh, you know, <laughs> you found the basic level of respect. Well done. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Congratulations. You've cleared <laughs> the lowest bar of the you know. Well, well, I guess the highest bar. We glued it to the ceiling. Just. <laughs> There you go. Exactly. Yeah. Just briefly, then I want to talk about the last scene because I do love it that um, there's a celebration in the holodeck, but uh, all two takes for is feeling a bit sad. Uh, he doesn't deserve it. And uh, Data, again, with all the wisdom, sees that, yeah, you had no choice. I only see that you put yourself through the pain because it ultimately was necessary to, you know, to not have the summary judgment to, uh, to have me win the day. Um, you know, Riker says, you're a wise man. Uh, and Data says, not yet, sir, but with your help, I am learning. 
I was like, oh, that's how you end it right there, making me feel the endorphin high of like, yay. Yeah. <laughs> Woo. Like, come on, let's go to the holodeck. We're going to eat cake and be friends. Like, yay. oh, I'm there. <laughs> I'm absolutely there. You know, just absolutely. Yeah, I'm just right. completely uncynical to that, even though I'm sure there's reason that you could be, but I was like, I don't even care. Yeah. Let's just go be friends. <laughs> yeah. it, 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 it finds its way to the last remaining shards of joy and wonder I have left. <laughs> <laughs> it, it made my heart grow three sizes that day. <laughs> I'm going to move to the next part of the, the next part of the review then um, actually before i do that have you got any other things you wanted to kind of touch on about the episode that i might have glossed over or uh i think we pretty much got everything hmm. yeah if it's anything else is just i don't know your, your reminder that bruce maddox is is, is a bag of dicks <laughs> <Like, Yeah. laughs> we've covered that it's fine Precisely. Um, so the next thing I'm doing in this series is to just to review uh, the episode under this new lens and to say, um, could you give me your favorite character, your favorite moment, and your favorite line from the episode? Spark analysis. <laughs> uh, I already know favorite line just because it's so <laughs> fucking weird and it keeps sticking. O'Brien, right at the top. Time to pluck a pigeon. What the fuck, O'Brien? <laughs> because Data's a rube. He's like, yeah. He's I know. Rube. But like, damn, <laughs> dude. All right. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. That man doesn't have a reference that isn't at least 150 years old. I swear to God. We love O'Brien. <laughs> O'Brien is the most important man in Starfleet. No, because it's Ireland. Uh, They're still living with chickens and bales of hair, remember? Yes. <laughs> I know, apparently. Yeah. You know, it's... Uh, that fucking Planet Ireland episode. Anyway, um, but probably mm, best scene's got to be with Guinan. Like that's that's mm. obvious. That's obvious. And you just yeah. like, and probably when you when when it finally like in his head slavery and, and Guinan has this look like, oh hey, welcome to the conversation. You just got here. <laughs> yeah. yep, there you go. I believed yeah. you could do it, but I will say we were skeptical for just a bit. <laughs> That's fair enough. And then favorite character then is the last thing you haven't uh, you haven't given us. Uh, favorite character? I did like Judge Lady. She was fun. I don't know why I okay. can't remember her name right now. Philippa um, Louvois, Captain Philippa. There you go, Philippa Louvois. Come I on, the name is straight out of a romance novel. <laughs> I know, right. Um, I'll just deal with the, my quick things then, which is to say that I thought my favorite character was, again, basic bitch of me, but it was Data. Um, yes, it could easily have been Picard, but um, I think Data kind of, it's all about his rights and his kind of humanity, and uh, I responded to that, so that would be what yeah. I would go with. Um, I didn't want to be really obvious with the scene, so I actually went for... Picard's um, meeting the three criteria of sentience bit um, in the courtroom is my favorite scene um, where Picard just schools them um, because my favorite line, as I said earlier, I wanted to give it in full to give it the respect it's due. Forgive the um, very bland nature of the dramatic reading, but it is um, consider that in the history of many worlds, there've always been disposable creatures. They do the dirty work. They do the work that no one else wants to do because it's too difficult or too hazardous. And an army of data's all disposable you don't have to think about their welfare. You don't think about how they feel. Whole generations of disposable people. You're talking about slavery. I think that's a little harsh. I don't think that's a little harsh. I think that's the truth. But that's a truth that we've obscured behind a comfortable, easy euphemism. Property. But that's not the issue at all, is it? I love that. <laughs> that is yeah. trekking a nutshell right there. <laughs> awesome stuff. Um, so, yeah. Uh, the next section then is uh, just my little thumb, middle finger up to uh, all the people that are like, oh, Star Trek, it, it fails when it doesn't meet Gene's vision. So it's a section that I literally call Gene's vision. <laughs> nice. So basically what I do here is to ask if you think there's anything in the episode that fits into this grand ideology that all these people spout out like it's a religion of um, the, the greatness of Star Trek. Because I think there's always something there, which is basically my point, because even when we review the new stuff, it's like there's something yeah. to be found. Um, so what, what would you of the galaxy. yeah yeah exactly um, so what would you say is um definable from this episode as like the, the kind of trek flavor of that um i i guess uh probably just you know new permutations of you know 
new life and new civilizations. You know, they mm. do hit you right on the head with it by pointing at data yeah. in the episode. But Yates, yeah, it's it's right there. You know, yeah. uh, a, a, and so yeah, if you want to, you know, speak to it as Gene's vision, like, yeah, that's you know, they're definitely trying to find the new shit out there. Um, mm. But I, I I don't know. It, Gene's vision is great, and Gene's vision is also a vision of of a cishet white guy from... Well, from it doesn't always work. I mean, the first thing I've noted in this section is that, ironically, yeah. um, if he'd had his way, this episode wouldn't have happened because of the whole lawyer's thing. So it proves that yeah, despite what, people, exactly. you know, despite what yeah. people claim, that you know the guy isn't infallible. And, you know, like any genius, I guess, in that way, they are flawed individuals and people. And yeah. the man isn't a saint. Let's not pretend otherwise. But um, Yeah, no, God, no, absolutely not. Uh, and, just uh, gender has a wonderful video that kind of covers... Uh, yeah. All like uh, the whole Gene Roddenberry video that kind of covers the length and breadth of that guy, and he's absolutely. I think it's nice that people have. Uh, it's it's nice that people have identified sort of the Trek thing of like the the ideology and the idea of what you're uh, striving towards. But I do think calling it Gene's vision is a bit of a misnomer because I think the grand idea of Gene's vision is sometimes in spite of him rather than because of him <laughs> at times. I... Uh, <laughs> I think we could do so much better. We can be beyond Gene's vision. Like that's exactly, that yeah, yeah, yeah. the real thing. Yeah, is is that Star Trek can teach us to go beyond it, you know, yeah. and, and to evolve it to where you know that that you know it looks basic by comparison, you know, as far yeah. as where thought can evolve to. Completely. But having said that, I mean there are things that. Uh, Trek was exploring b because they were started by Gene that I think is here and that's things like the nature of humanity uh, the exploration yeah. of like why you're here the idea of the soul in the machine that comes up a lot especially in the original series um, and obviously the idea of looking at social issues through the allegory of sci-fi um, is very much th that kind of idea and um, I just remember I had when I was younger this is how dorky I am when I was an, a younger teen I had a poster on my wall that was um Everything I learned, I need to know about life I learned from Star Trek The Next Generation. And um, it was all funny things. Like if, you, if you've if you talked to one Borg, you've talked to them all and et cetera. You know, there's no problem with chocolate. Sunday can't solve. Um, and I just remember right. that one of them, one of them that always stuck in my head because it relates to what this episode is saying is just um, humanity is defined by feelings, even in androids. And I was like, yeah, that's it. That's it. Could have saved myself 45 minutes right there. <laughs> right, there you go. There's your whole thing. Save yourself the time. Absolutely, but no, I love that poster. And uh, finally, yeah, just the idea of the ineffable nature of memory and lived experience over facts, I think is very, yeah. uh, very Gene's vision-esque. So, it's very nice, uh, though. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm aware I didn't actually tell you that to, to do this, so apologies in advance, but what I'm going to ask for now is um, just to finish off with a brief conclusion, like a paragraph or so, um, and then a score out of five Star Trek Deltas. For the episode um so did you want to go first or do you want me to go first and give you time to gather your thoughts with it you first I, i'm gonna let this mull in the brain pan and see what i got Fair enough. mine are always super over prepared so apologies in advance but i just said um yeah. wow if i was asked to pick one single 45 minute piece of tv to show what star trek can be what it's capable of the big questions it's unafraid to ask then this is my number one choice Look, I love the space laser battles and the sexy spaceships, the fun episodes, the romps and more, but this to me is what sets Star Trek apart. Deep philosophizing while being completely engrossing, engendering audience empathy to a massive level and showing that extremely personal stakes can sometimes be far more powerfully affecting than even the entire galaxy being threatened. Action, acting, direction, writing, everything here is as close to flawless as you can get. Not just perfect, but absolute gold star, other level great. Easily one of my top five episodes of all Trek, even today. Uh, the score is probably going to be anticlimactic now, but obviously I went with five Starfleet Deltas out of five. Uh, I rather liked this one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, it, it is a classic episode. Measure of Man Speaks for Itself. It has its own weight within Star Trek in and of itself because of everything you just said. Yeah. And how representative it is. And how when you have, you know, really good science fiction, something thought-provoking, you, you can spend a buck oh five to produce that episode and have something amazing. Because mm. that's what it's about. As you know, as as much as we love some run and gun, they do some beautiful things on Discovery. There's amazing visuals that you could do, but that has to be in service of you know 
really good stories and, you know, and philosophy and hell, you can build a whole episode just on the science philosophy part. So mm, completely. Yeah. Awesome. Um, Feels silly to rate it at this point. It's like, it, it's a classic. I don't know. Take the five and then dip it in gold and put it on a thing and a couple of candles. It looks nice on the mantle. It's great. It's a, it's <laughs> let's, let's go with five out of five. Then, in that case. Right. <laughs> um, that's fair enough. Cause that also means that uh, I don't have to work hard to work out the average once again, uh, because yeah. the, the podcast overall score for this episode is Another perfect five out of five. The third Yay! already in this particular series. It right. joins uh, it joins the Tony Paper Moon and the Raven as considered perfect episodes. So Ooh. yeah, it's only a paper moon for sure. The Raven, really? Yeah. We we'd like it. <laughs> Quite uh, <but> like <laughs> <laughs> well, you weren't on that episode. So. Yeah, I, got, yeah, I know. Yeah, I got to, take it know, up with Linda that. Butler. <laughs> I, I guess. Linda. Okay. Awesome. That's great. Um, just quickly, then to finish off, I just wanted to do the uh, what I call the audience interaction section, where I basically ask on social media for people's opinions on things. Um, but being a bit trek nerdy, I like to call it subspace communications. <laughs> Incoming yeah. transmission. Awesome. Uh, so, yeah, just a handful of uh, tweets that I got back in response to what are your thoughts on this particular episode. Um, Steve Wasling at Simarad says, really good. I like that Riker gives it his best despite his personal feelings. Okay. John Glasgow says, classic episode, one of the best Trek episodes of all time. Sir Pat was at his absolute best here. Okay. Um, at Niall underscore Max Dead controversially says, I like it, but I always think it's overrated. Author, author, does it better? <sighs> Ooh. Agree? Disagree? <laughs> uh, uh, different. Not yeah. better. Different. Different. <laughs> That's fair. Um, Tofa's Tom Foolish Tweetery. Tom Foolish Tweetery. He deliberately did that so that I was going to. Tofa's Tom Foolish Tweetery says, it's an interesting premise. Premise. If we, the audience, didn't know data, we'd probably side with Maddox. I'm not sure I agree with that. But we know him, we empathize with his desire to become more human, therefore we care about his rights, uh, which illustrates the very real importance of empathy. Okay, that's fair enough. All right, um, yeah. They have me fooled uh, in the first half, not going to lie, but, you know. Yeah. <laughs> fair enough, yeah. And finally, uh, my friend Ramon Urquiza simply says, a great episode. Uh, so, yeah, straightforward and to the point. So there we go. There um, right there's a, a whole list of um, superlatives that I can give for the episode. Um but suffice to say, if you go looking, countless publications have list listed this as like top marks or one of the top five, 10, 25 episodes of Star Trek. Um, yeah. So it is, it definitely has earned its reputation as solid gold classic, I would say, probably more than any other episode I've reviewed. Um, oh, so yeah, it was, it was a pleasure being, uh, being joined by you and reviewing it. And it was nice uh, hanging out and having a laugh for a little bit for a yeah. bit. So, this is um, great. Absolutely. Well, I mean, it was nice to to meet you, I guess, in person ish, virtually. So, yeah. <laughs> so, um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's as close to meet space as we're going to get without actually having to go. <laughs> Thank you uh, so much for agreeing to come on and join me because it was, um, it was actually a fairly last minute audience. I had somebody else drop out and then, uh, Jeannie agreed to come in and, uh, it's turned out to be a great episode. So that's always a uh, handy. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, and if you ever have an open spot, I'd love to do this again. Definitely, yeah. I will definitely keep you in mind and uh, 100%. Um, keep in touch via Twitter and stuff and we'll work something out and that'll be cool. Uh, so in the meantime, uh, did you have anything you wanted to plug or just where people can find you on socials and the like? Um, I'm at Captain underscore Janie on Twitter. Uh, trans Lumber Party is at Trans underscore Party. Uh, if you are trans or non-binary or gender non-conforming and you, you'd like to hang out with... Uh, similar folks and a place to get away with all the stresses that come with, you know, being somebody like us, eh, come on in. It's a good time. Uh, you know, I, I'm not your mom. You do what you want. It's great. <laughs> I think you've probably been a great advert for that here as well, because if people have as fun of a time as, uh, as you've had ripping into this episode on occasion, then uh, that's awesome. So. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> you can just see me from this very couch. I mean, you're going to exactly, exactly this rectangle. It can be yours. 
for the low low <laughs> price of clicking shit on your phone. You know. <laughs> awesome. Fair enough. Uh, you can find me, of course, um, at Ian Mike Wilson on Twitter. Just my name on like Instagram and Facebook and all that. Like, not that I go on them often. Uh, the podcast is at H O M Trek or Hom Trek, all one word on Twitter. Uh, it's just hit or miss Star Trek podcast on Instagram. And yeah, that will conclude this episode. Uh, thank you so much again, Jane, for joining me. Um, we will be back next week where I will be joined by my best friend of many years once again, Stephen Brown. Uh, and we're going to be reviewing the Lower Decks episode, I Excretus. So kind of back on the Borg theme. <laughs> awesome. So yeah, uh, in the meantime, everyone, remember, we are Starfleet. Live long and prosper. Live long and prosper.